Outside the box with Jeff Conine. We are back for July 26th. It's been a while, Jeff. Last time we spoke several months ago, but we went through your best pitcher. We were building the ultimate pitcher, one pitch from each of the nastiest arms you've ever faced. And we built just the best arm possible. We're doing the same thing with hitters today and a few other topics I'm excited to get into. But Jeff, what have you been up to? I feel like a lot of people, I've been getting a lot of DMs. Like, wh- when are we going to hear from Jeff again? So I, you know, I know you finished out the FIU season. Now you're kind of back to having some more free time again. So how's that been? It's uh, boring, actually. You had a lot of free time. <laughs> uh, no, they're, um, you know, officially let go from FIU. They hired a new uh, head coach, uh, Rich Witten uh, from VCU, I believe. And uh, they rounded out their coaching staff uh, probably about a week and a half ago. So uh, myself and the pitching coach were let go. And so I'm officially not employed by FIU anymore. But uh, it was a great experience. You know, I, I really enjoyed getting on the field and, and working with those kids and um, you know, trying to make an impact. Um, and so now I'm just kind of writing out the summer and I might have some other gigs lined up later down the road, but, uh, those will, we'll see what happens. Well, I, I mean, I'm sure you'll have plenty of gigs lined up, but we'll, we'll definitely have a little bit of an easier time overall for both ends for us to, to get together and, and have more of these conversations. And I mean, this is the best time of year to do it, right? We're, we're getting into the dog days, but also the really fun time we have, you know, trade discussions starting to, to, to stir up and, you know, your trade deadline story on, up on an airplane is one of my favorites ever, but mm-hmm. also just get to the postseason and, and a lot of things that are starting to come on the, on the way as well. Uh, but there's two things I want to talk to you about. We're going to do it after we break down, you know, your, your ultimate position player. Nick Castellanos had an interesting back and forth with a reporter. You and I have talked about umpires and back and forths with umpires and, and things like that. We've never talked about back and forths with reporters, which is funny because I technically, you know, have worked in that as a reporter, although I, I like to think I'm a little bit different than that, but I'd still am the guy in the clubhouse from time to time asking questions. And you obviously were the guy answering the questions for, for, for 20 years. So I'm very interested to get into that whole debacle uh, in that whole situation. But I want to start with a little bit, some more fun here and start with, you know, that position player that we put together because it's all you, I know you put together, I'm going to just tee up and kind of see what we're going to go with here. Did we decide exactly what tools I gave you like the rundown, but if you wanted to throw in some other tools, if you wanted to throw in some other things game for that, but what tool do you want to start with as we build this ultimate baseball player? Well, yeah, you know, you, you think about the scouting tools, right? The, the scouting tools are yeah. the hit tool, uh, power, uh, you've got speed, you've got arm defense, and uh, what's the other one? I wanted to throw in clubhouse persona as well. I threw that in there because I know that's something that's always been really important to you. You always talk about the best teammates you've had and things like that. Obviously, I want to throw that in there as well. But yeah, if there's, as we're talking, maybe another uh, category or something that kind of stands out with a player, maybe we can lean into that. But should we start with the hit tool? Yeah, let's start with the hit tool. Um, and, you know, I kind of broke that down a little bit into, obviously, you got the power that's uh, also in that hit tool. It's not in the hit tool, but uh, hitting in general. Um, but one of the things I wanted to focus on first was contact. Um, just making the, the sheer ability to make contact with a baseball. And, you know, um, as you know, I'm not a big um, right now up on current players and, and watch a whole lot of baseball now. So I'm going to have to refer to guys that I played against. Uh, for the majority of my career. That's that what I we want to. We, to. we want guys you played against. That's That makes it so, more fun. You um, saw it. The most incredible contact hit tool guy that I ever played against was Tony Gwynn. I knew it. That was this the one. This guy was absolutely, I mean, he never, I don't even think he struck out more than 40 times in an entire season. But one stat I pulled up, he had over 10,000 plate appearances in his career and he struck out 430 times. I mean, that's two years for Joey Gallo was, right now. Yep. But we're talking for an entire career, and we're talking 10,000 at-bats. And there were many years he struck out in the teens. There was one year uh, late in his career, I think he hit 372, and he struck out 18 times that year with 600 plate appearances. I mean, it's, it's mind-boggling what this guy could do, how he could control the barrel, how he could find a hole, that third base hole, first base hole, depending on where it was pitched. That's where he's hitting it. And whatever, as a two-hopper, a line drive, 
you know, he wasn't a high OPS guy because he didn't have a big slugging percentage. I think his career high in home runs was 17 one year. But when you talk about just being able to put the sweet spot barrel on the ball, Tony Gwynn was head and shoulders ahead of anybody else that I ever played against. And what's pretty amazing is he still like put up a decent slugging percentage at 459 in his career. So, you know, it's not like this guy was just a slap hitter, a lot of extra base hits still. Well, it, it, it helps when you start the base at 340. Yeah, yeah that is <laughs> career average. That, is that always helps the slugging. You don't have to have too many doubles to get it back up over 400. <laughs> that, that is a good point. And what do you think his career strikeout rate was? Oh, it had to be uh, around 4%. 4.2 percent yeah good call and so i want to ask you just from it's almost in the most simple way possible is it just hand-eye coordination is it body movements and flexibility what is it that that makes him or made him so good with the bat to ball i mean i know there's a lot of different factors and you know being able to control and adjust the barrel like you mentioned but probably a combination of things but if you could pick out maybe like one or two characteristics that made him just so much more adept to making contact. What are they? Well, I think first and foremost, uh, his mental approach to an at-bat was as good as they come. And he knew exactly what his talents were. He didn't try to hit home runs because he knew it wasn't a home run hitter. So he's going to get base hits and uh, simple mechanics. He had a very simple, repeatable swing that he knew he could get that barrel to any part of the zone that he wanted to. Um, but he was the consistency of his approach, I think, was uh, what made him one of the greatest hitters of all time. And every single night that he came up to the plate, it was a joy to watch that this guy, you never you never saw him take bad swings. You never saw him uh, lean over and try to check swing at a ball because he was so well balanced all the time. He saw the ball so deep all the time. Uh, and I wouldn't say he had a lightning quick bat like his exit velocities wouldn't have been near where the top of guys are today. But he just tracked and put the barrel on that thing so well. Uh, his hand-eye coordination, his, his barrel awareness was, for me, top guy I've ever seen. I mean, it's hard to dispute the numbers, too. And what's amazing is, is also that, you know, even in the early days, he stole a lot of bags, 56 stolen bases one year. I don't know how the defense was, but I, and I've, I've heard and read nothing but great things about who he was as a, as a person as well. well I don't know. If my top many... guys, you know, we're talking about clubhouse uh, personalities and, and clubhouse leaders. He would be one of my top guys. Really? In Everything that I heard about him. Yeah. That's awesome. And, and a guy that also knew a little bit about college coaching, right? Didn't he coach for a little bit at San Diego, yeah, was it San Diego, San Diego State? State? Yeah. Yeah, yep. I mean, and, and now you can appreciate too. I mean, it's so much work, right? I mean, just that it's it's a it's, it's a full it's a time gig and then some as a college coach. But it seems like Tony Gwynn, from everything I've heard, read, and watched interview wise, uh, he seemed like the perfect guy to be kind of mentoring kids, especially nowadays. Fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Any honorable mention? So you you uh, kind of gave me a little bit of inspiration a few months ago. And I, it's just kind of resonated in my head for a while on two guys to, to, to dive into every once in a while. I was on a plane and I was flying and, and I was like, I want to dive into George Brett and George Brett's 1980 season. If you, as you've mentioned to me is one of the best seasons of all time. The year before that he went 20, 20, 20 though, 20 triples, 20 homers, 20 doubles, which has only been done like seven times in baseball history. Uh, are there any honorable mentions in the, in the hit tool department uh, that you, off the top of your head that you might want to give a nod to? Well, one guy that uh, I think we've talked about before that uh, similar to Tony Gwynn uh, was Wade Boggs. I mean, talk mm -hmm. about uh, a guy that made uh, hard contact all the time, knew his lane, even though, you know, I read a book by Ted Williams and there was a, kind of an epilogue uh, in this book. And he, he said he didn't really particularly care for Wade Boggs because of he knew he had power, but he didn't use it. So when you saw Wade Boggs take batting practice, I mean, it was one of the most impressive batting practices you're ever going to see. This guy would go from corner to corner and, and most times not even hit a ball behind the one that he hit the time before that, pitch before that. And then at the end, you know, he'd have some fun and start just popping balls out of the yard. I mean, he's a big dude. He's 6'3". Had these giant forearms. Um, and I think one year he hit 24 home runs. Yep. You know, he came out of his box a little bit, hit, hit 24 home runs. I'm like, oh, and this is back when 20 plus was an actual uh, milestone. You know, if you can hit over 20 plus home runs, you had some pop back then. Um, but just talk about, I mean, there was some stupid stat that he didn't pop up to the infield. He had no pop up to the infield in like 1,300 straight games or something like that. It was insane. 
or didn't pop up to the infield in some ungodly number of at-bats, you know, and that's how well he could put Barrel on the ball uh, like Gwynn, you know, not quite as uh, high as average as Gwynn, but way up there and, and one of the best contact guys you'll ever see. I mean, 7%, 6.9% strikeout rate in his career. Obviously, we know what, what he did in the hits department and, and obviously one of the best hitters that we've seen. It's interesting, the power thing. It reminds me of, of Ichiro because you, you've talked about that. And we've heard that a lot about Ichiro, how he had more juice in there too, but kind of just chose to, to not really try to swing for the fences. But in batting practice, you saw on a few occasions that he could pop it out. Oh my God, he had one of the most impressive batting practices you'll ever see. And for years and years and years, guys on his team, especially would try to get him into the home run derby. And he when never went for it. He never said, I'm going to do that. So, you know, I asked him one day, I'm like, dude, why do you try to go deep every? He goes, I know how to hit a single. I know how to hit a single. That's easy for me. I want to go try to go deep in batting practice. <laughs> it's it's funny because it, those guys, you know, I, I think the game's cyclical. I think those guys are, are starting to make their way back a little bit. We're seeing more value in those types of players, but um, you know, you can, you, you can be even more surprised seeing those kind of guys nowadays that are really willing to, to stick to the bat to ball, but let's go to the opposite. Now then power wise, who is the number one power guy for you? I, I would imagine that it, it could be the all-time home run champ, but we could talk about maybe someone that hit the most prolific home runs. We could do a little bit of both here. Uh, what, what, yeah. what did you have in mind for me? The most shocking like bat speed, just standing there uh, and I got to be on the field watching this guy take batting practice. And, and even when you see him on TV, the, the most shocking bat speed and just violent swing I think I ever saw was Mark McGuire. Oh, McGuire. Um, McGuire was just and hit the most majestic home runs. I mean, these home runs were absolute bombs. Like every one of them just were, you know, you, you talk about Stanton right now and, and Stanton hit the ball as hard as anybody that I've ever seen hit a baseball. And StatCast in that era backs that up, right? Um, I don't think we had that back in the day with McGuire. I don't know if he ever got the tail end of track man or any of that stuff, but when you watch the ball leave his bat and the, and the violence of his swing and the, and the bat speed going through, it was nobody like it, you know? And, and when I talked about standing on the field and, and watching him hit the ball for the first time, I was in Kansas city. We had interleague against St. Louis and his group was Mark McGuire, Jim Edmonds, Ray Langford, and Bernard Gilkey. So you've got three stud baseball players in the same group as Mark McGuire. But when he stood in there and took swings, I mean, you stood back and you're like, holy crap, there's not even, it's not even close. The bat speed, the bat head speed that, that went through the zone with McGuire and those other guys. So when you watch him take batting practice and you watch him hit his balls in, in, uh, in the game, uh, for me, that was the most uh, incredible power I've, I've ever seen. Well, and if you go by just, almost home runs per game. I would be interested to see where he stacks up with some of the other players because didn't have the longevity uh, as some of the other guys play a lot of games, 1800 of them. But I think if you, if you saw him play more games, I think he easily could have been in that 700 home run conversation. And if he had the same amount of ABs as some of these other guys probably could have been right there. I even look at the last two years of his career, 89 games at age 36, he hit 32 home runs. I, the guy barely played the season and hit a full season's worth of home runs. You know, he played a little bit more than half the games. And then even at, at age 37, 97 games, hit 29 homers. What was it that cut his career short there? Or, I think injuries. Uh, I had, I, if, I do, if I recall, it was back issues that he had that he just – uh, That's what I thought. He couldn't overcome that stuff because when you got that kind of torque, torque. Uh, going around that body like that, um, you know, it creates quite issues. Like Donnie Mattingly had uh, severe back problems. That, that basically got him out of the game too. Um, but McGuire was just um, the way he was built and the, and the different, he wasn't a big lower body guy. His upper body was massive. And the way, and he's a fairly big stick too. He's a 35, 33, I think, uh, bat, but it was all in the head. So I think um, that might've contributed to that lower back issue as well. And I mean, how many at bats did he have? Like 6,000, 7,000? Yeah, and it's 6,187 at bats. That's crazy. And he had 583 home runs. When you look at Bonds and some of these guys had, you know, Bonds probably didn't have that many at bats, but he had probably 10,000 plate appearances, which, yep. you know, that catapults McGuire into home run record territory for me. So by 162 game average, uh, Barry Bonds, and we know he's a little bit of a different player coming up and, and was more of that speed and did a little bit of everything. So it's it's a little bit of apples to oranges, but still, 162 game average, 
41 home runs per season for Barry Bonds, which is absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. One, 162 game average for Mark McGuire, 50 bombs, 50. So I, I think it checks out Just four more seasons. Yeah. And he's got the record. And, and four I more mean, full this seasons, is... if he would have been able to stay healthy. And I think he, he was out for a long time with a foot injury too. If I remember correctly, it was something wrong with his foot early in his career that he struggled with and, and had to bow out for, you know, he, he was an injury plagued couple of years for him. Uh, but if he played full games or full seasons, that's only four more years. And he still would have been at like 8,000 at bats. 1993, 1994, he played a combined 74 games mm -hmm. in those two seasons. So you can basically chalk that up as like a full season and a half gone. And that's in the middle of his prime. That's age 29, age 30. Yep. So based on his averages here, it would be conservative to give him 80 home runs there. Um, yep. So you, you give him 80 more. He's at six, you know, 660. And then you figure he doesn't get cut short at the end there. He's easily in the 700 territory. So I, I, I think that's very fair. 7,660 plate appearances for him. 12,606 plate appearances for Barry Bonds. Wow. Uh, and they both walked at a very high clip. Nobody walked as much as Bonds, but they both walked at a very high clip. So honestly, I didn't even realize that. That's why I love having these conversations is I know that Mark McGuire was, was one of the best power hitters to ever do it, but you don't realize that like based on what they did when they were on the field. And then Griffey's kind of in that ballpark as well. It's just in a different way. Um, these guys are right up there. Or if not, you know, some of the best to ever do it in terms of home runs per opportunity. Uh, but of course, longevity is a big part of baseball. Yeah, that's just it. You know, you, you, we talk about guys that are in the hall of fame that didn't put up those great numbers or those uh, some of the guys didn't even lead the league in their categories very much, but they're still in the hall of fame because of that Thank longevity you. factor that you have to bring into the uh, conversation. Well, how about Ortiz? Because he, before we move on to the next tool, Ortiz, you know, just inducted into the hall of fame. Um, what amazes me the most about him is, is that he had an OPS over a thousand in his final season at over, over the age of 40. That's um, crazy. I think that's only been done by four. I've, our friends at Codify had a tweet out that it says had it only been done a few other times that were all hall of famers, except for Shoeless Joe, I believe who obviously should be a hall of famer, but you know, did, did that whole thing where he threw the games allegedly. But the, the interesting thing is how do you do that at age 40 or age 41 or age 42? I mean, we saw bonds do it. We saw Ortiz do it. You saw players, you, you went into age 40 playing baseball yourself, but you saw other players, you know, kind of hit the twilight of their career. And, and you kind of see them slow down. How rare is it to, to be able to put up a season like that on the final season of your career with 18 plus under your belt? Well, you just said it. I mean, it's only been done a handful of times to have an OPS that high over 40 years old. Listen, I mean, baseball, you know, people think it's not that physical a sport. You know, you're standing around a lot. But the torque and what that does to your joints in your body and, and how that breaks down over time, I think that's why you barely see any players especially nowadays with these huge contracts, the back end of these huge contracts, guys just can't perform like they did at the beginning because their body breaks down. That's all there is to it. And I think the guys that are uh, much better at taking care of themselves early in the career and just and stay consistent the whole time with that program going through, Ichiro, for one, this guy took care of his body better than anyone I've ever seen, even as a young player. And here he is playing at a high level in his mid-40s, you know? Yeah. That's a rarity. You know, I don't think you got guys that are at the tail end of their careers that are working as hard as Ichiro does. And I mean, granted, you got aches and pains and you got stuff going on that uh, just doesn't allow you to play like you did in your younger days. But some guys are just more gifted genetically that they were stayed away from that injury bug late in their career. And on top of that, they worked as hard as they did when they were early in their career. So that, that gave them that longevity. How annoying are those guys? <laughs> it must, it must I be admire crazy. them, man. I just, yeah. you know, because I, I was the same, you know, I worked hard. I didn't have the, the talent to, to put up those big numbers late on, but you know, uh, I love working hard even late in my career. And I was around that I got to play until I was 41. Pretty awesome. It's a, it's a rare club to make it to, you know, the 40 year old MLB player club. Uh, I don't, I don't know what the exact number is, but very few players, a small percentage are one good enough to last that long. And then two, uh, you know, really able to take care of themselves enough to last that long as well. We'll go to speed. Cause I'm interested on speed. Cause again, you think traditionally, maybe it's just the best base dealer and Ricky Henderson, but that might not be the case. We're also just talking about maybe the fastest guy 
you, you saw maybe a little bit of both. Where are we going on the speed? Yeah, tour? I did a little couple different angles on this, you know, because uh, obviously you think speed, think uh, let's go with the, the most stolen bases of all time, which Ricky Henderson put up a number that's never going to be touched ever no. again, not even close. Um, but interestingly enough, he got thrown out more than anybody else too. Uh, so his percentage rate of stolen bases, uh, even though he had so many more than anybody else, he tried more than anybody else too. I mean, when he got to first base, you knew he was going. When he got to second base, you knew he was going every single time. So um, I took that into consideration. I wouldn't even say he was the fastest base runner that I saw. He was uh, extremely good at getting up to speed in the first couple strides. He got the top speed very, very quickly and knew how to read pitchers. And, uh, you know, he's very successful at, at the stolen base game. But early in my career, I played with a guy that, that was just one of the best base runners I ever played with. And that was Carlos Beltran. Huh. Talk about a guy that, you know, patrolled center field, uh, could absolutely fly, but he was a smart, smart base runner. I think at one point he had 50 stolen base attempts without getting thrown out. And I think if I'm not mistaken, he holds the record for the highest stolen base percentage if you get it up into the over 300 stolen base uh, club. So 312 bags, he was thrown out 49 times. That's pretty I mean, amazing. Henderson did that in one year. He got thrown out 49 times in one year. I think he's, and, when he stole this 140 something, he got, he got thrown out like a 49 times in one year. But you got Beltran who had, I think he had 50 consecutive stolen base attempts without getting thrown out. It's crazy how good he was at, at reading pitchers, knowing situations when to go. And, you know, he had 312 total, but he might've only had not only 50 might've been his, his highest during his career, but Every single year, man, this guy just uh, knew how to run the bases as well as anybody. Yeah, and you talk about running the bases, how much of it is is also, you know, like taking that extra 90 on a dirt ball or or being able to get that read on a ball in the gap better than anybody else. Like, you're, you're saying Beltron in every facet of base running was the most impressive base runner you saw. He was solid in all levels, you know, and a lot of times, you know, a double is made in your first three steps out of the box. Right. If it's not a ball down the line or a, a, it splits the gap somewhere, uh, you could get a double without having those things happen. And nowadays, wow, there's a lot of coasting going in yeah. first base and you just don't see that effort um, that you used to see. And uh, I don't get it. No. There's one thing that takes no talent and that's to hustle. It takes no talent to hustle. Um, you know, I, that's the way I was brought up and that's why I was taught to play the game and you know, I didn't have very good speed, but I made some singles into doubles because of laziness on the part of the outfielders. And that was made because I ran hard to first base. Um, I would say every single time, but the majority of the time I was running hard to first base, regardless of where the ball was. Well, but we saw like Tony. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. What you're saying. I was just going to say, we, we saw the White Sox training staff and Tony La Russa basically said, yeah, we're, we're telling our guys to kind of dog it. Uh, we're telling our guys to jog because everyone's getting hurt. And I'm like, if you, if you can't sprint full speed, maybe you just shouldn't be playing. Feet. Yeah, maybe you shouldn't be feet. playing. If you can't make 90 feet, you probably shouldn't be playing ball. A professional athlete. You should, you should heal up. up, you know? And I thought that was pretty wild, especially from Tony La Russa. Uh, right. But also, Tony La Russa, you don't know what you're getting nowadays. Uh, but yeah, the White Sox have been a bit of a disaster. I think they're just trying to stay healthy. But I agree. I mean, the hard 90 is is pretty much the one thing you can control. And also you steal a few hits here and there. You steal an extra 90 feet here and there. Talk about slugging percentage. We talk about base hits and numbers that can make a big difference at the end of the season and, and can, can really give you that nice little nudge and, and boost those numbers up a little bit. Uh, what tool do you want to go with next? Well, I was just going to do some honorable mentions here on base. Oh running. yeah, of course. Let's talk about flat out speed. You know, I got to play against Deion Sanders and. Uh... <laughs> oh yeah. That's awesome. I mean, holy cow, talk about uh, someone that just moves effortlessly and with mind-blowing acceleration. Uh, I remember playing against him in AAA. He was coming up with the Reds. I was with the Royals at the time, and we were in Omaha, and he hit a ball in the left center gap. And I see him. I'm playing first base. I'm watching him run out of the box, and he was getting after a little bit, but our left fielder dove for the ball and missed it. And then I saw him, like, shift down a couple gears and then take off. And he was at home plate before our guys could even run up, get it to the cutoff man. And there wasn't even a play at the plate. He zoomed around the bases faster than anybody ever seen. And then, uh, so he's always been as far as flat out straight speed, one of the fastest human beings I've ever seen. 
And, you know, I'm going to use this guy maybe a couple of times in this conversation is Bo Jackson. You know, I saw, and I got to play with Bo Jackson and, and, you know, 235 pound running back to move that mass that quickly. He's still to this day, maybe the fastest person I've ever seen on a baseball field. I saw him beat out a couple of ground balls to shortstop hoppers to two hoppers to shortstop on a turf field. And back then when the turf was lightning fast, he would beat it out. So um, just an extraordinary talent. And that was with the hip issues at that point too, right? No, this is pre-hip. Pre-hip, pre-hip was. So I that's mean, cool. You got to see him like full fledged go. Yep. Full fledged bow. And uh, it was, it was exciting to watch. It was, it was, uh, I would pay money to see that guy play any sport. Well, so here's my question with those guys, because obviously they, they did not have the ability to or the opportunity to be able to just play baseball 24 seven and everybody else is playing baseball just about 24 seven, which of them was, I, I would assume the answer is Bo, but were, were they both, did they look like football players that were just such freak athletes that they could survive in the major league baseball climate? Or, or did, did you see both of those guys like legitimate baseball players that really, no, they you know, were, they were legitimate talents, legitimate baseball players, but raw. You know, they didn't dedicate, like you said, 24-7 to baseball. Half the year, I mean, Bo was, as soon as it was football season, he was gone. And that's what he did until spring training, probably. So I just wish we could have seen him, you know, get that career another five, six, seven years. Because I'm sure football would have would have been over at some point. You, you run out of juice there faster than you do in baseball. And if he just focused just on baseball, you know, his hit tool would have gone way up. He would have, his strikeouts would have gone down. Uh, his defense was legendary. I mean, this guy would have been, in my opinion, a Hall of Fame baseball player. I, that, well. that was going to be my question. If Bo Jackson stuck to, to Major League Baseball, is he a Hall of Famer? And the answer you just said is yes. I think so. Yep. And, and Sanders, I think easily, if he sticks to baseball, is, a, is it an all star, excuse me. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you just, that talent, you just can't, that speed tool for one. Uh, but they could both hit. They could both make That's contact. Thing. Dion more than Bo, like he could just slap the ball on the ground and beat it out because he was from the left side. So uh, Bo is just raw, just power. Man, this guy hit the ball as far as anybody I've ever seen. And just, uh, you know, we've seen the highlights. We, they yeah. still talk about him as being one of the best athletes. And that was 30 years ago. Which is, which is unbelievable. Uh, what's the next tool? Um. Next tool uh, we could go with because defense could be outfield and infield. I don't know if you you picked one or the other. How'd you approach the defensive side of things? Um, I I thought of both. You know, okay. I thought of both. Let's hear, um, I thought let's of hear. you know the, the great shortstops that I played with and against, and some of the great third basemen and some of the best outfield arms that I played against. Um, so we'll start with outfield. And, you know, one of the greatest or most exciting plays for me is an outfielder getting an assist, like throwing somebody out at third base or hosing somebody at home plate. And this guy actually hosed me out at home plate uh, probably more than once, but one, uh, I think you brought the clip up. Uh, But Ichiro in the outfield was one of the most exciting defenders uh, that you'll ever see and one of the best arms that you're ever going to see. And, you know, Ichiro's six foot tall, 165 pounds maybe, but the arm speed and velocity he could create with that body was just uh, absolutely staggering. And, you know, I look back at my career and, you know, I say I would have paid money to watch Bo Jackson play. I would have paid money to watch Ichiro play early on because this guy could do it all, man. He's going to change a game both defensively uh, with his bat offensively on the base paths because he was a great phenomenal base runner as well. Just a, a total package of an exciting player. Uh, so you talk about the time getting thrown out. Did you think there was any chance that that ball was going to get there before you? A thousand percent. I yeah. couldn't believe our, my coach sent me, you know, I'm going around, I'm running as hard as I can. And I'm thinking, all right, he's going to throw me the stop sign up. I'm going to go back to, but he starts waving me home. I'm like, wait a second. It's Rose out there. No, oh, this is not going to end well. And I was posed by 10 feet. He threw it all the way in the air from mid right field. And, and, you know, Camden yards has a short right field on top of that. And he had to come in on a little bit. And yeah, I had no chance. Any honorable mentions? I know Bo Jackson has that legendary throw where he catches it like flat footed and, and looks like he short arms it. And it's just a, a seed into the infield. He had a number of uh, legendary throws uh, and a guy that, you know, didn't have a great, not a great, just a long career, uh, a lot of all-star games, but one of the most feared throwing arms in all of baseball for a long time was Mark Witten. 
uh, he, he was another guy that I played against the Meyer leagues um, and had one of the most devastating cannons of an arm that you'll ever see. It was just like watching it leave his hand and stay on a line as long as it did uh, was, was, you know, it was a thing of beauty. And let me guess on the defensive side of things, are we doing like outfield, like just, just in terms of tracking down fly balls, or are we also going to do infield, just, just glove work? Yeah. I mean, you know, you look at best defenders uh, for me on the left side of the infield, you've got Scott Rowland um, was just an absolute stud over at third base, made every play. Uh, I wouldn't say he had one of the greatest arms of all time. He had a strong arm, but um, Ken Caminiti had one of the strongest arms of all time and made one of some of the most ridiculous plays uh, you're ever going to see. That that guy always pops up for me. Um, you know, I saw uh, toward the mid to late in his career, Ozzy Smith, what he could do with a glove. Um, uh, Omar Vizquel, who we've talked about on, on other podcasts, what he could do with a glove was just magical. My teammate um, in, in Baltimore, Mike Bordick, what he did in one season was absolute set major league records and, and didn't get the gold glove, but one of the finest defenders I've ever seen. And, you know, um, Derek Lee over at first base uh, yeah. when I was with the Marlins, you know, you've got um, Mike Lola third and, and Alex Gonzalez, another, probably the best hands I've ever seen at shortstop is Alex Gonzalez and Luis Castillo, a gold glove winner at second base and Derek Lee, a gold glover at first. That infield collectively was the greatest defensive infield uh, that I ever played with or saw uh, on a baseball field. I, I was going to ask you that. Cause I mean, that, that infield just, the, I, I think back on it a lot and I'm like, how do you beat that? How do you beat that group there? I don't know. Uh, I've never seen a double play turn more quickly than, than Gonzo and, and Louie. They just, it, Louis it almost looked like it didn't even hit his glove. It just, yeah, it just was hand, already in his hand. <laughs> he just redirected Gonzo's throw to first base. <laughs> didn't have a cannon for an arm he could let it go when he wanted to but he didn't need to he used the bag because back then you could take guys out he used the bag as his protection and he would kind of jump back and and get rid of it the guys never touched him it was amazing and then outfield it's got to be andrew jones right andrew jones uh is number one for me as just far as a game-changing defender marquise grissom was up there too uh as far as a, a defender that uh um, you feared when the ball got in the air, you knew it was going to be caught. Uh, Larry Walker, a new Hall of Famer. Uh, talk about one of the great all-round players. When you talk about yeah. arm, he had a cannon for an arm. He had speed. Uh, he's a great defender. He's a great average guy, great power. Uh, kind of all wrapped up into one, this, this superstar. Um, and then, of course, you got Barry Bonds in left field who won, I don't know, a dozen gold gloves out there. He was pretty decent too. Yeah, before he got a little hefty there, he used to move pretty well and, and the arm was always there. Uh, I was thinking about just what Andrew Jones was able to do out there. You talked about how he would play in, right? And just Super anything shallow. over his head, he would run it down. And it was just annoying because he'd steal hits in front of him and then he also would steal hits over his head. How old do you feel that Drew Jones was the number two pick in this year's draft? And Jackson Holiday, son of Matt Holiday, was the number one pick in this year's draft. Crazy. <laughs> Crazy, right? <laughs> that made I don't me know if you've seen those. I don't, yeah, I don't know if you've seen those viral videos when uh, the guys are chanting overrated. Yes, yes. Of Drew Jones, Jones, and he hits a bomb right after that. But, I mean, he's the number two pick. Arguably, it could have, could have been the number one, number one, one. And these guys, you got them overrated. Yeah, whatever, guys. Yeah, <laughs> there you go, right? Yeah. And handled it well. Handled it well. It seems like the son of a uh, of a longtime big leaguer. And, um, yeah, that's one of my favorite videos out there. And I think it's safe to say he's he's probably not overrated. Uh, nope. Neither was his dad. I still think he, he's he got a strong case for the Hall of Fame, but we'll see. Um, what other tools do we have to go through here? I think we, fly, we flew through everything, right? We just have. We just have the, well, you got uh, the makeup club, tool that we make up to maybe a little Which bit. Is, but I just want to mention one guy that kind of combines a lot of these tools that we we're talking about, especially on the offensive end, not so much defense, but for me, Albert Pujols had the greatest first 10 years of any career ever in baseball history. Like he, I think his lowest OPS was 955. Uh, he got under a thousand, one of them, we had a 997, but everything else was 1100, 1200, a thousand. And for at 21 years old, when you hit 320 something in the big leagues with a 130 RBIs, that till he's 31 of the greatest 10 years, maybe offensively of any player in history. 
I, I always look back at that because and I know it's, it's really hard to do that for, for so long, but I'm like, imagine if he could do that for just even three, four more years. If, if the first three or four years in LA or Anaheim at the time when he was there, if he could do that same thing, you know, and just kind of continue not fall off that cliff. I mean, he already is one of the all-time leaders in so many different categories, but I mean, could have been clear cut maybe as, as the, one of the best hitters uh, or the best hitter of the modern era. I still think he has a legitimate case, but it would have been almost like a shoe in uh, if, if he didn't fall off a little bit, but it is pretty cool to just still see him hitting a little bit. I don't know how much he caught at the Derby, but he snuck his I way through shocked, the first man. round. I was shocked he put that many out. It was uh, good for him. It was impressive. The swing play is still, he's 15 shy of 700, probably won't get there, but six home runs this year. Uh, and, and I'm excited. I already have my tickets to, to that last game in St. Louis. The second he uh, announced that, or they announced that he was signing with St. Louis. Uh, it was like one in the morning. I, I popped out of my bed. I got my laptop. I bought the tickets and thank goodness I did. Cause they're already five times more expensive than they were when I got them. Um, so not selling those. I'm looking forward to going to that game. Cause it's also Yachty's last game. And it's also most likely Wayno's last game. Hopefully he gets the ball that day, wow. but that should be a pretty special, uh, a pretty special day over in St. Absolutely. Louis. Absolutely. Absolutely. <clears throat> so, I want to talk to you about talk about big fan bases and, and really exciting fan bases that that get very passionate. Philadelphia, those fans, we've talked about it. You played there briefly. You've played there as a road member uh, quite a lot uh, through the years, especially with the Marlins. And uh, there was an interesting situation where we, we we know Nick Castellanos, South Florida guy, big time free agent this year, got a lot of money, uh, more than a hundred million to be exact, and he was asked the question because he's been struggling mightily um, and there were boos raining in. And you know, that comes with the territory and, and he didn't, he didn't react to the boos on the field. He didn't do anything. He didn't gesture. He walked back to the dugout, just like he has uh, unfortunately a lot of times this year. Then in the, in the clubhouse after he was asked by a, a veteran and well-respected reporter in Philadelphia, uh, who is phenomenal at his job, but asked him, do you hear the boos? Cassianos did not like that question. Um, obviously that is after a bad game where he obviously did hear the boost and Cassianos responded sarcastically and said, no, I, I went deaf, you know, and, and said, that's a stupid question or that's a dumb question that resulted in a back and forth. And the Philadelphia reporter you know, started wagging his finger at him and, and they had to kind of like be, I wouldn't say they had to be separated because Cassianos didn't move one inch. Um, the, the Philly reporter wasn't going to do anything, but it was still that like raising the voice and pointing the finger. I saw a lot of people in the larger, you know, scope, you know, outside of Philly media saying like, Oh, that was a dumb question. I agree. And I saw a lot of people in the Philly media defending um, you know, the, the, the media member, the reporter that, that kind of went after Cassianos a little bit saying that he's a pros pro, you got to be able to handle those questions. Harper handled, handled, handled those questions in the past, uh, blah, blah, blah. As a player who's probably been asked some stupid questions, uh, throughout your years, what do you make of that whole situation? Well, what's the, my, my question my question maybe to him would be, what, what's the point of your asking me that question? So the you know that I'm struggling mightily. You know I came in with a huge contract. You know the fans don't like me right now because I'm underperforming. What is the point of him asking that question? And what other answer could he give? Hey, do you hear the booze? And it wasn't like, hey, do you hear? No, it was, it was, a, it was a jab. I thought it was a jab. Like, hey, do you, in that third at bat, did you hear those booze? Like, I mean, what's he supposed to say? What's so he supposed I, to say? Yes, I, I, I agree. What would be the follow-up question if he said, yes, I did? I mean, how do you what, does that bother that? you? Yes, how of course you? it bothers you. I'm an athlete. I just had a bad game. I've been struggling mightily. I've got all this intense pressure on me. Philadelphia, when I got traded there, I got texts and, and emails and mess, phone calls from ex-teammates saying, man, you're going to hate it in Philadelphia. I'm like, really? They're like, oh my God, it's brutal to play there. And I will say as a visiting player, it was tough. Those fans are tough. They're blue collar. They want to see good baseball and they will let you know that anything that you mess up, that you messed up. So I was going in there kind of afraid. I'm like, oh my God, this could be a long, longest month of my life. And I remember the first night I'm playing, I'm playing right field and Ground ball in the first inning, ground balls hit to third base. And my job as a right fielder was to back up the throw. So I run over and 
throw goes to first base, caught it, throw back around. I peel off and I'm running back to right field. And all of a sudden, you know, I got my head down and I hear all this clapping going on. And I'm like, what are they clapping for? And then I hear a guy go, hey, Conan, way to go. Bobby Abreu never did that shit. <laughs> and I looked up and I'm like, what's he talking about? And I'm like, I guess Abreu didn't back up first. So I was just doing my job. I'm backing up first and they're clapping for me. And I'm like, all right. So the next at bat, I go up there and uh, I pop up with a guy on third base and less than two outs. So I'm pissed. I throw my bat. I run to first base and I'm pissed. Right. And I'm about to run the dugout. I'm like, oh, this, I'm going to hear it here. You know, people are going to start booing me. And so I'm about to go down the dugout and some guy says, yeah, I don't wait, Conan. That's all right. Get him next time. I'm like, what? Get him next time. That doesn't <laughs> sound like something that a Philly fan would yell at if you didn't do your job, you know? So anyway, a friend of mine was at the game. He lives in Philly and he's like, you know what? That's why they're going to love you here because you show you care. Mm -hmm. You were mad that you didn't do your job. And when you had an opportunity to do your job, you did it. You know, it's just kind of like they want to see hard nosed ball players. They love Chase Utley. Why they? Yeah, he was a good player, but they loved him because he would run over the second base if he needed to. He'd run over the catcher he needed to. He'd run through a wall to get a baseball. If he, they loved Chase Utley, loved him, and that's the kind of ball player they wanted. Scott or um, uh, the center fielder um, came over from the White Sox that ran into the outfield fence and broke his nose. Oh, I know who you're talking about. Shoot, bloody. That's, his was that Aaron uh, Rowan? Yes, Aaron Rowan. So this guy did that. He could do no wrong in Philly. They absolutely loved him in Philly because he was willing to run through a fence to grab a baseball. And he came back bloodied and they love him there because they yeah. want to see that. That's what they that's what they relate to, you know? And so Castellanos, you're, you're, you've got a, a guy that got a superstar contract that's going in underperforming and he knows it every single night. They're letting him know that he's underperforming. And I'm sure he's pressing he's like crazy just to try to put up numbers so he can stop all the booze. But then you got the reporter just has to poke the bear. He just poked the bear. And, you know, I've wanted to say that a bunch of times in questions, but you know what? I owned up to a lot of it. I'm like, Hey, I deserve it. You know, i made the error. They want to boo me. That's their right to boo me. That's all there is to it. But when you get to that point in a career or a season that you've got that much hype put on you and you've, you know, got the big contract that was very well publicized, there's a lot going on in Castellanos' life, and he didn't need that question at that time. I, I agree. And look, could Castellanos have responded better? Of course. Of course he could have. I, but at the same time, it's not like he, you know, got personal with him or, or really like shot, you know, fired shots at him. He just said, dumb question. Don't appreciate it. Um, That's and a stupid question. And I, I, for me, I it just, was. I mean, that, that, there was nothing that he could say that made that a great question. Yeah. And, you know, what a lot of people could have ordered it differently. Like, hey, did you hear the booze? Like, Hey, Nick, I know you've been struggling a little bit, you know, and, and that it's got to affect you. How does that affect you? How Something you, like that. Just How do you handle the, the pressure from the fans? Like, you, yeah, you could frame I mean, it. Of course he hears the booze. And uh, no, I agree. It just kind of came off that way. And this is a veteran, though. I mean, when Salisbury is one of the most well-known and well-respected guys in Philadelphia media. So th that's why you're seeing a lot of Philly media back him. I'm not saying the guy should, should be in trouble or anything like that, but I think, you know, you, got, you should be able to own it too, right? It was a bad question. Just like Castellanos is playing bad or playing poorly, that was a poor question. And sometimes, you know, reporters are off their game a little bit too. And I thought that was an instance where he was a little off his game because these aren't – players are not circus animals, right? Like in what other circumstance is a reporter or a person, you know, that's more than twice the age – of of Nick Cassianos and less than half the size is he going to be pointing his finger at him and raising his voice at him in any other area of the world that's not the clubhouse they're, you're not doing that you're, right. you're not getting in that guy's face so that's where it gets frustrating for me it's just that like that protection that you have as a reporter where you can kind of say what you want or ask what you want to these players and even if they don't like it what are they going to do? They, they can't fight you. They're not going right. to come at you because they have way more to lose than you do. So it, it's one of those things. And I'm not saying Salisbury is trying to be in, like, you know, instigate anything or anything like that. But when you're raising your voice at a player, that's where you, you kind of lose me. I think it's okay. We all ask dumb questions from time to time, but that one, uh, that was an interesting situation. I was excited to kind of get your perspective on that because I'm sure you've been asked plenty of questions. You don't like most of the time you just eat it and let it go. Um, but I don't know if you've ever kind of, had to deal with that kind of, uh, you know, 
booze raining in day in and day out in Philly. Yeah. I can't I mean, imagine. You know what? I would have given that first answer. I was sarcastic to our guys and our guys knew me and they knew my sense of humor. And, you know, if somebody would ask me, Hey, did you hear the booze? I'm like, no, man, are you kidding me? I can't. What'd you say? Yeah. Like I would have feigned deafness as well. Yeah. Um, but I would have gone to the other. That's a stupid question. Yeah. Could somebody else I answer this? Yeah. I would have let it go at that. And next somebody else asked their question. I or agree. I agree. And that's why Castellanos kind of let it compound, but uh, I thought it was just an interesting thing from, from your lens being that you you've probably dealt with all sorts of those kinds of situations uh, to wrap up. I want to talk about the Jersey. Um, of course it looks like a Marlins teal. So Mariners. No D backs. No. Nope. Nope. What? It looks like a teal bluish pinstripe. Am I wrong? What's a blue pinstripe? Who else? The, not the Expos. Blue pin. Oh, Dodgers. That's it. No. Dodgers don't have pinstripes. Come on. Yeah, I don't know. I'm b- blue pinstripes. The second largest market in the country. The second largest market. Maybe the in third. The, second largest market in the country. Maybe the third. Second Maybe third. the Mets. That's the first largest. Yeah. Who's the blue jersey? Come on, man. Who would blue What's the be? second or third largest market in the country? LA is number two, probably, right? I would say so. All right. Number three would be where? Chicago? Yes. Okay. Okay. So it's it's Cubs. Yeah, there you go. Okay. All right. Well, we're off to a hot start. <laughs> um, now I got to guess the player. I, did, I had a good shot at any team. And I, all right. So. What, what position we got? Any, 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 any context you can give me here? Um, <clears throat> I'll narrow it down for you. It's not from this generation. Hall of Famer. You played against him? I did not play against him. So he predated you? Yes. Okay. Cubs, Hall of Famer, predated you. You never overlapped with Ryan Sandberg? I did. You did? I played against Ryan Sandberg, yep. So it's not Sandberg position outfield no no sorry not outfield infield infield infielder chicago cubs legend ernie banks there you go Ooh, that was good that was good that's an awesome jersey again reminder for our folks on youtube or or our folks listening on the regular podcast to check out the youtube to see the jersey that is a sweet one one of my all-time favorite baseball cards is an ernie banks card oh you've even got the autographed uh picture there from is that from your golf tournament yeah you look like a spring chicken there yeah well i was and he actually wears a hat that says ernie banks mr cub on it can you believe that that's awesome that's awesome. The late Ernie Banks uh, passed away back in 2015, but I've I've read nothing but great stories about. Oh my God! Ernie. What a nice gentleman. He yeah, was, let's was, let's hear a little bit about your Ernie ambassadors experience. of the game. You know, I I offered. Uh, he was uh, in town for something other than my golf tournament, obviously, uh, and there was a mutual contact that we had, and he he asked Ernie if he'd play my golf tournament. He said, "Sure, I'll play in his golf tournament." So he came and was just very gracious. Thanks for the invite. And, you know, we talked baseball a little bit. He came back a couple more years after that. And just one of the nicest men, you know, we talk about ambassadors for the game. Tony Gwynn was such an amazing ambassador for the game. Uh, Kirby Puckett was such an amazing ambassador to the game. Ernie Banks is right up there with you. Just a, a quality human being. Do you know where he went to college? No idea. University of Chicago. Really? Wow. That's what it says on <laughs> his baseball reference. It's pretty crazy. Um, pretty let's play two. <laughs> let's play two is probably one of my, one of the best baseball quotes. Yeah. Just quotes of all time. Um, was that like your first time really meeting him was at your own golf tournament? Yeah. That's yep. pretty freaking awesome. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and I, I think that's kind of a testament to, to what kind of guy he was. If, if you're invited to a, a charitable golf tournament for a player that you, you don't really know. And just said, yeah, and I was young. It was young in my career. It's not like I had, you know, it was a fellow all-star. I think it was just a, you know, had a nice golf tournament and we made some money for the children's hospital. And he said, yeah, I'll sure. I'll play. How, how was he as a golfer? I don't know. You didn't see him. No idea. A lot, a lot of, a lot of people to keep up. He didn't win. Obviously you would have remembered that, 
Yeah, um, have you had any multiple winners in that golf tournament? Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, multiple winners. We had, um, it's a running joke of one of my committee members that, uh, unfortunately just passed away. Um, he was from the original committee back in 1995. Um, and he was at every golf tournament for 27 years. Uh, but he would always, he put his charitable team in and he always handpicked his golfers and he probably has more first place trophies than <laughs> all the others combined. It's all about winning. Even, even at the charitable events, That's you right. got to, you got to recruit the best golfers and they always won. Baseball players are, are some of the best golfers out there. I know you, you, you've been trying to get your game up now too. I know you did a tournament not too long ago and, and, yeah, and working on good. that a little bit, but um, when's the next co nine uh, golf tournament? I know we COVID kind of, delayed some things there no we had a record year this year um we raised more money this year than we ever have so uh next year i think it's uh january 23rd is our 29th golf tournament wow 29 wow. years we've been doing the golf tournament what are we doing for the 30th maybe i'll be able to, to play in the blowout one. yeah we're gonna we're gonna have two courses that year and we're it's gonna be very very special so very excited about that and um so many amazing event. things that you guys do um poker tournament that's more uh, that's more my speed so not this year uh we were hoping to get it in august uh, at hard rock again this year but we're looking for next year back, okay uh, back in action next year i'm cleaning house in that one right. uh, i'm looking forward to the poker tournament i was always too young now now we can definitely make that one happen but again so many great things and those are all for conine's clubhouse right in, in the joe dimaggio hospital Yep, the Conine Clubhouse at Joe DiMaggio Children's Hospital. It's um, a place where all the families can stay free of charge. Not all of them. We can't. We don't have room for everybody, but but a lot. Uh, right now, we have 23 rooms, and we're expanding. There are four more rooms under construction, so we have 27 rooms. And it's just, you know, it's like a nice hotel that the families can stay free of charge while their kids are being treated at at Joe D's. And and this is something that you guys really thought of when you were there for your youngest son, right? Who who we, we, well, was, was yeah, we had to use, we had to use the, it was called the visitors clubhouse back then. Um, but we did, we had to stay there and our golf tournament, you know, we, as a committee decided that we wanted to direct our funds to the visitors clubhouse. And, uh, we basically operate that building for the year. We pay all the salaries, we operate the electricity maintenance, all that stuff for that building. So after seven years, um, they graciously, gave us the honor of putting it and putting our name on it and naming it the Conan clubhouse. And for those who would want to maybe, you know, be able to, to contribute to that uh, with, you know, when it's not a big event or anything like that, are there ways for, for people to be able to, to donate? Absolutely. To um, clubhouse? You just get on it. Uh, Joe DiMaggio Children's Hospital Foundation, and you can earmark funds uh, that go directly to the Conan clubhouse to, um, to help in our mission of, uh, you know, keeping that fund fully, funded so yeah uh, no one ever has to pay anything to to stay there and and i mean you, you can't imagine how difficult it is not only for the kids but, but for the families of the kids that are you know receiving treatment for whatever it may be at joe dimaggio's you know which is one of the the leading in so many categories for the hospital for children's hospitals so you know this is one of the coolest things i know it's really really special to you guys because it, it hits close to home and um very much encourage anybody to donate to that and excited for some of the events coming up and i think we're going to be doing some crossover just baseball uh fundraisers coming up i have some stuff to run by you off the air as well but uh that'll do it for this episode of outside the box with jeff conine it's great to be back and uh Looking forward to some more fun topics as we move forward. A little bit more Juan Soto talk. We didn't get to talk about Fenway Park and things like that. So a lot more exciting discussion for the next episode. But it was really fun building your ultimate baseball player here and kind of just diving down into all of the incredible players you got to see through the years and uh, with all the years you played on the field. Uh, any final thoughts? No, it was great uh, talking shop with you. You know, this is what I live for. It's uh, I'm a baseball player, always have been. Um, got to talk to my son today. We chatted about hitting for about 45 minutes. And, and this right now is, you know, as you've seen my room before, it's uh, <laughs> a lot of memories up here and it, it brings back a lot of, a lot of cool stuff. Your recall is unbelievable. And, and especially with the numbers. So excited to continue to dig into that uh, over the next few weeks. And as we continue to churn out episodes and shout out to your son who homered yesterday, uh, hopefully for a nice little hot streak as we wind down the season over the next couple months, but maybe triple A will be coming up soon for him. Until then we will talk to you next time on outside the box with Jeff Conan. Thanks arm.